Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Let's start with the last session of the day. We have John Quackenbush from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard School of Public Health, who is going to tell us about message passaging, uh, passing. <laughs> I failed as a chair. <laughs> Close enough. Uh, well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much to people at Microsoft for the chocolates, although next year Xbox. <laughs> uh, I want to take some time. It was, it's been a very interesting day. I've been here since this morning, but I'm, I'm going to commit the intellectual equivalent of the dine and dash. I'm going to do this and then run out and say, who's that? Uh, but I started off adding slides after Jill's talk. And then, as everybody else talked during the day, I sort of refined things and explained a lot of the underlying biology and the questions. I peeled them back. So what I'm going to do is really focus on what I thought. Could you turn your mic on, please? Oh, I'm always so loud; it never seems to matter. But uh, there, it's green. All right, the light is green. The trap is clean. Name the movie. All right. So um, I, I'm going to focus actually on the things I told you I was originally going to focus on, which is this idea of message passing as a model. But I have to give you some background for that as well. I build models, and I like quotes. Uh, so this is one of my fam favorite quotes. This is from Sam Carlin. The purpose of models is not to fit the question, not to fit the data, but to sharpen the questions. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to describe models as a way, uh, and I'm going to talk about this later, in which we look at biological systems and try to understand the underlying principles that we can elucidate about those systems given the data we have. But I struggle with answering a question which I can tell you I cannot answer, which is, are the models right? And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, but this is a really exciting time to do science. And I like quotes. I like to quote the great thinkers. So this is something you should all put in your slides. Every revolution in science, from the Copernican heliocentric model to the rise of statistical and quantum mechanics, from Darwin's theory of evolution and natural selection to the theory of the gene, has been driven by one and only one thing, access to data. And I totally like to think, quote, great thinkers. You should as well. Uh, this is probably the most <laughs> profound thinker I've come across. But this, I, I really think this captures a lot of why I'm so excited about the work that I do, that we have access to just unbelievable quantities of data, and this is really the future. So we tend to think about, uh, in my group, the whole history, the life history of disease and how we look at disease and how we place that disease into context given the data we have. So we have these technologies that have really been spawned by the Genome Project that allow us to measure genetic background and estimate genetic risk to do better early detection by looking for things like circulating tumor cells or circulating DNA from disease states. Uh, but once we do that, we want to stratify patients, stage disease, and really use this kind of information to select the right treatment options. I think as Zach pointed out, we have all these things we try to estimate, like lifestyle and environment that we really don't have good data on. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we end up doing is trying to use all the data we have uh, to really select the best treatment options for our patients and to improve their quality of life. And that sort of underlying thinking drives a lot of what um, I and my group have been doing over the years. I mean, one of the things I always like to point out is our patients want exactly the same thing we want. We're all going to come to the end of our lives. We want it to be as far away and as pleasant as possible. And so in order to be able to help really inform this process, we've had access to tremendous quantities of data. A lot of this has been with arrays, but increasingly we're generating data using these sequencing instruments. And what it's done is it's increased the volume, velocity, and variety, to use the big data terms, of the data we can generate. Um, because it allows us to generate integrated data sets with multiple independent types of genomic data from the same individuals. And that really opens up new interesting opportunities to do analysis, particularly, as Zach pointed out, if we can place it in the context of the biological and clinical data that we have. So how do you turn this, this vision into a reality? Well, there are lots of things that you have to do. And if I were giving a different talk, I'd talk about each one of these because they're essential components. You have to assure access to samples and consent. You have to have a technology platform for generating data. You need to think about integrating information. And this is really critical that if you have disparate stores of information, you can't bring them together, you can't link them, you can't associate them, there's almost nothing you can do with the data. As you do this, you have to think about communicating 
information back to your constituents and colleagues. You have to think about enabling research beyond what you can do because people come to my door every day and knock and ask for help analyzing data. So you need to come up with strategies to support and enable that. You have to engage corporate partners. And this is something that in academia sometimes is a bitter pill to swallow because we think we can do everything. And we can, but it's just not as good as, or as well as other people can sometimes. You have to communicate your mission back to the broader community. And a lot of what we try to do is actually do public outreach. Uh, and then you want to do research. And I'm going to really focus on this last piece. But being able to do research demands that we do all of these other things in some kind of sensible way. So genomics has produced tremendous quantities of data. Has it transformed medicine? Well, assembling a reference genome has not in and of itself transformed medicine. But really, these technologies have, have spawned uh, vast quantities of information and really allowed us to generate data that it itself, the data itself is really transforming biomedical research by allowing us to ask new questions. So this is the era of big data. And the real challenge is to bring all this information together to understand things like disease. So how do we do this? Well, the answer, in my mind, is to look at networks. And I'm going to tell you about an approach we've been using to look at networks by starting with a very simple question. What are the subtypes in disease? And this is actually a question you've heard alluded to a, a number of different times today. Everyone tries to do this. Everyone tries to build predictive biomarkers. Most predictive biomarkers fail. Many predictive biomarkers do no better than random sets of genes trained on the same data. So what's the reality? Well, the problem with disease is that we often don't really understand what the subtypes are. They're difficult to recognize. We have diverse data that sometimes tells us different things. And again, if I were giving a different talk, I could tell you about how we've approached the question of robust biomarkers and really looking at those biomarkers. But what I want to do here is just focus on a simple observation. So we've been studying ovarian cancer for a number of years. It's the fourth most common cancer in women in the US. It actually has one of the greatest death rates because women tend to be detected, or the disease tends to be detected late. When it's detected, women are treated with a standard regimen of chemotherapy, independent of what the subtype of the disease is that they have, because we really don't understand the disease that well, and we really don't understand the molecular profiles of these different subtypes. And so most women develop chemotherapy-resistant disease and succumb to it. We were actually involved in a project in which we were able to take 132 women, profile them with microRNAs and mRNAs, and get gene expression data on those patients, link it to clinical data, and our first goal was actually to find genes that correlated with resistance to chemotherapy. And as we tried to do that analysis, we failed miserably. Because what we discovered was that the clinical definition of resistance or sensitivity to chemotherapy was a mean time of progression of greater than or less than six months. Which means that you can move from resistance to sensitive simply by having your appointment rescheduled. Which means it's a completely meaningless definition. And that's often what you find when you look at clinical data. The clinical definitions have little to do with the underlying molecular biology. So we started to look at the data in more uh, detail. And we asked ourselves, well, are there particular subtypes? Can we identify subtypes in the data? And so we used a technique. This was really work that Stefan Bentick did in working with me. I uh, used a technique called ISIS. And uh, I forget what ISIS is an acronym for. Uh, but he used ISIS to really look at splits in the data. I'll explain what ISIS does. And we found a subtype associated with the expression of angiogenesis genes. We curated all the publicly available data, which in and of itself is not easy to do. And we validated this separation. So here's the basic idea behind ISIS. What we do is we take measurements, in this case, on 132 patients. For those patients, we have measurements on 12,500 genes that were on this array. So we have this very large problem if we were looking for correlations between profiles, gene expression profiles, and subsets of the data. And anybody who's worked with big data sets can tell you that if you take a data set and randomly divide it, you can always find some feature in the data set that distinguishes between the two subtypes. Okay? So what we do is we do that, but we recognize that something approaching a real separation in the data is probably not going to be supported by just one or two statistically significant differences, but by many. And that, on average, there are going to be more significant differences than you'd see for a random partition that has no basis in biology. So you take this and you divide it many, many, many times. You look for a good partition. 
In fact, you use Fisher's rule for combining p-values to look at the top 100 genes. And then eventually you get to some point where you're doing something like k-means clustering and shuffling things back and forth to find really robust subtypes. So that's basically what we did. And we found this subtype. Now I apologize, the colors have changed from uh, blue and yellow to uh, red and uh, blue. But if you look at this, what you can see is there's one group clearly over here. And the rest of the group, they're about one third of the patients, about two thirds of the patients. And these are patients who exhibit an angiogenic subtype. The, uh, the, the separation is really driven by genes associated with angiogenesis. There's statistically significant differences in survival in our data set. And in fact, in the two years this paper was in review, more and more publicly available data uh, was accessible. And so what we were able to do is really show that this difference in survival persisted as the amount of data grew. All right, So it's a very robust subtype. It's clinically significant because it's associated with angiogenesis. And there are actually clinical trials underway in which patients are being treated by angi with angiogenic inhibitors in addition to standard chemotherapy. The numerology behind it is that about one third of the patients on the treatment arm respond. Okay? And we would say that one third of the patients should be likely to respond. But we don't have any direct data yet to tell us whether that one third are really the one third who are responding. Because we haven't had data on patients in these trials, although that's changing. Nevertheless, about one third of the patients have this angiogenic subtype. So we published this, I think, in 2009 or 2010. And um, it describes these subtypes. And, and there's actually software for doing classification to assign patients to the different subtypes. But how do you actually use these subtypes as a way to understand disease in the process driving disease? Well, we've been working on building network models for quite some time. And what we really want to try to do is use information about these networks to understand the basis for disease. Now, why are we interested in networks? Well, you know biological processes are not driven by individual genes, although we tend to think of them as being associated with particular genes. And in fact, everybody who talked about disease today talked about genes because they're tangible elements that we can discuss. But we really want to understand what's driving these. We want to understand the causal relationships. We want to understand the processes that are happening. And even the earliest papers describing gene expression analysis had the implicit assumption that if we look for correlated patterns of gene expression, those were probably tied to underlying networks or processes that were somewhere in the data. So what we want to do is we want to find networks using available genomic data, which is largely expression data. So when we talk about networks, what are we actually describing? Well, I can begin by telling you what we're not talking about. We're not talking about metabolic pathways like those in the KEG database. We're not talking about signal transduction pathways like those in BioCarta. We're not talking about biochemical pathways like those in the Beringer ingelheim wall charts we use to terrify our graduate students. Uh, we're, we're really talking about something a little bit more abstract. So what we mean is that genes are some kind of nodes in the network. Those nodes are connected by edges. The edges are, can be directed to imply some kind of causal interaction. And what we want to do is try to infer those edges recognizing that they may not be direct interactions, that we may be missing things because we're not measuring them, that hidden behind this edge, what may be happening is there are proteins and genes and metabolites and all sorts of things playing some role. But what we're doing is we're looking at the data and we're using the data to infer the state of the purple gene given our measurements on the state of the blue gene. So it's an inferential network driven by data that we have available that tries to capture the associations that are really hidden in the data sets we have. And my thinking about how to build these models is really driven by my background. I'm not trained in anything reasonable for doing what I do today. I actually have a PhD in theoretical physics. Uh, but in physics, we recognize there are two strong pillars supporting scientific inquiry, theory and experiment. But we also recognize that somewhere in the middle, is a field that we call phenomenology. So ultimately, what we'd like to do is develop a theory that describes the systems we're studying. The embodiment of that theory should be a model. But these systems we're studying are extraordinarily complex. So we recognize that there's this middle ground between theory and experiment that we call phenomenology. And in phenomenology, what we try to do is build empirical models that are consistent with our theoretical understanding, but aren't directly derived from them. Okay? So we're going to try to capture the essence of what we know without necessarily fully modeling the system. 
in part because we know the data that we have are incomplete. So how can we construct a model that captures the essence of the system in a way that leads us to a better understanding of what's happening? So as we do this, we recognize the question no longer is, is this model right? But rather, going back to Sam Carlin's quote at the beginning, is this model useful? Can I actually learn something that's going to inform my understanding of the system and maybe inform future experiments? So how do we do this? Well, one of the fundamental principles that's really guided my whole group in doing research over the last few years has been the idea that we shouldn't have to derive these models de novo from the data. And I've gotten a lot of grief from referees about this. They say, oh, you know, you should be able to learn this from fundamental principles. And that idea is just crap, OK? If you know something, use it. And it was actually a group of scientists at Microsoft who really underscored the importance of this. Uh, and there's a beautiful paper published in 1996. If you haven't read it, read it. It's by Wolpert McCready. It's about something called the No Free Lunch Theorem. They were looking at this uh, problem of ensemble classifiers and finding weights in ensemble classifiers. And what they demonstrated is there's no general purpose optimization algorithm that works best in all possible situations. The solution to that is to make a reasonable guess. And what they showed in this paper very eloquently and uh, very elegantly is that if you make a reasonable guess, you rapidly arrive at a near optimal solution. OK? So if you don't know how to solve a problem and it's a computationally intractable problem, make a guess. We actually first used this in a paper that it was published in, I think, 2008 on Bayesian networks and described seeded Bayesian networks. We've since abandoned Bayesian networks for a whole host of different reasons, including the fact that they don't capture feedback in a very simple way. But we've used this principle of making a reasonable guess as really one of the driving principles in our construction of models. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to look at this network, or any network, and we're trying to understand how that network model changes. And what we're really seeing is that as we look at normal to disease transitions, the networks fundamentally rewire. Or as we look at different subtypes of disease, the networks fundamentally change. And part of the reason we can't answer the question, is the model right, is that when most people are asking that, they're asking, does the model you produce look like a picture in my textbook, which may be right for normal tissue, but isn't going to be right for disease states. We don't necessarily know what those networks look like. And I'm going to come back to that in just a few minutes. But we want to understand how these networks change, how they differ between states. So what we're going to do is model a very simple, very well understood process you've heard alluded to a number of different times today, and that's transcription factors and their activities in activating genes. Okay? So the model itself is very simple. We have a gene that gene encodes RNA. The central dogma of molecular biology is DNA to RNA to protein. So this is really storing information that's going to be turned into an RNA that's eventually going to make a protein. And a cell is basically a machine made of proteins. So you're making the fundamental building blocks for your cell. All right? In order to do that, you need to have an RNA polymerase bind and make the RNA. And typically, it's activated by the presence of transcription factors that bind and turn on the process and make it go. All right? So how do you think about that? Or how do we think about that? Well, the way we think about it is using a very simple idea, the idea of message passing. All right? so, Communication involves, in this case, a transcription factor and its downstream target. And like in any communication, there are always two active participants. So at the end of my presentation, I'm going to give you a quiz. Right? And we're going to see how well you do. All right? Now, if I'm having a conversation with Francisco, who introduced me, if none of you hear our conversation and I give her the quiz, if she does really well, then we know that she did her job and listened, and I did my job and told her about it. But if she fails miserably, right, then there are either one of two things that happened. She was busy sending emails and not paying attention, or I was talking about you know, my plans for the evening and why I'm not going to be here. Okay? So if she doesn't do well, you don't know where communications is broken down. But if I give you all the quiz and you all get about 90%, except for one person, then we know where the problem is, right? So if communication breaks down and we have a big enough network, we can actually understand where the communication channels break down. 
So in the language of message passing, the transcription factor would be responsible for communicating with the target. The target has to be available to respond. And so if we have a large enough network, we can actually capture those functions for each edge in the network. So what we did was we developed a method we call Panda, because all methods have to have cute names. And this is really the work of Kimberly Glass. And we use prior information. We use the fact that we have the whole genome sequence. And we know, based on the work that Martha and other people have done, that transcription factors bind to unique motifs in the DNA. And we can map those to the genome. So what we can do is we can create an initial network basically representing all possible interactions. Then we can take that network and use available data for each edge in that network to estimate these functions. And we can iteratively estimate the functions and trim the network until we converge to a network structure that makes sense, that's stable, given the data that we have. Right? So we downloaded data on ovarian cancer, which is why I was telling you about this analysis we did. We actually took the biggest publicly available data set from the, the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. And uh, we normalized the data. We assigned. Uh, uh, samples to angiogenic or non-angiogenic subtypes, and then we ran this message passing analysis. So the approach was actually very simple and very straightforward. What we did is we took the two independent data sets. I apologize, it's a little hard to see, but angiogenic is in red, non-angiogenic is in blue. We constructed networks given the data, and then we compared them. And this is the place where, as we start to build network models, I've really become interested in how we build these models and how we use them, because what we look at in these networks are differences in the edges. And what we've come to recognize is the atoms of the networks are not the genes, but the edges. And I can say that, and I believe it, and we talk about it all the time, but when you start to talk about the edges, it becomes very difficult because they're not tangible things that you can hold on to. So when we start talking about edges, we'll go back to the genes that are activated by those edges. But remember, the key difference between one network and the other are the edges, the communication channels, how those genes are being activated. So we can look at the edge weights, and we can find those edge weights that are different, and we can ask what genes they target. And what's really interesting is if we look at these, what we see is there are unique genes that are targeted, but there are also genes that are targeted in both subtypes, but by different mechanisms. Okay? The edges are different, and that's important. So if we look at the, the transcription factors that are actually the most active, what we find are there are 10 that have the biggest switch from one subtype to the other. And if you look at these, every single one of the transcription factors is associated with angiogenesis. Now, it's really easy for me to say this, but in my group, this is what we call biopoetry. Because I could probably take these 10 transcription factors and show they're associated with autism or Alzheimer's or almost anything that you pick, OK? So are they really useful or are they interesting? Well, the answer is yes. If we look at the transcription factors and their targets, what we find is that the targets are significantly differentially expressed, while the transcription factors aren't necessarily differentially expressed. If we look at DNA methylation data, what's also very interesting is methylation, which you heard can regulate gene expression. These genes are actually differentially regulated in a way that corresponds with the patterns of expression. So we can start to map out what these are doing. And whenever you show, do, give a talk like this and talk about networks, you have to show these. So these are the angiogenic edges. These are the non-angiogenic edges. Remember them. They're going to be on the quiz. Uh, they're very difficult to try to interpret. But what uh, Kimberly Glass did was she built this representation. And I apologize the transcription factor names can't be right around the center. I call it the spirograph representation. But what it's showing are the, the transcription factors which are more active in one subtype or the other and the genes that they're regulating or controlling. And what you'll start to see is there's some that are controlled by single transcription factors, but they're also complex patterns of regulation. It's those complex patterns of regulation that are really interesting. So you can look at the genes that are involved. We characterize the different genes depending on whether they're targeted in angiogenic or non-angiogenic subtype, whether they're upregulated positive or downregulated negative, or whether they have complex patterns of regulation. They're targeted in both, and they have complex patterns across the subtypes. But what's probably more interesting is 
the fact that when we look at these, we see an association between these patterns of regulation and now biological processes associated with angiogenesis. But more interesting is the fact that when we look at them and we look at the genes that are being targeted by multiple transcription factors, there are sets of transcription factors that occur far more often than we'd expect by chance. Right? So this is really interesting because what it's saying is it's not just different patterns of regulation between the two subtypes, but different patterns of combinatorial regulation between the subtypes. So when you start to look at this, what you really see is that there are opportunities to step in and interfere with one subtype or another, not by acting directly on the genes, but instead by treating with compounds that actually prevent the dimerization of some of these transcription factors and their subsequent activation of gene expression patterns. Okay? So by looking at the edges, what we see is something very, very different. And what we actually try to do is look at different drug targets, drugs that target these interactions. Okay? We have some supporting evidence. My boss is standing up telling me I have to be quiet. So we have some supporting evidence that, uh, that uh, looks at this not necessarily in ovarian cancer, but in a breast cancer model. And the interesting thing that we see is treatment with angiogenesis inhibitors in this breast cancer model produces in these different gene subsets that we defined exactly the pattern of expression that we would have predicted. Okay? So something's going on here. We've applied this in other situations. We've looked at asthma and treatment of children with asthma in response to corticosteroid drugs and see very different responses in terms of the edges that are activated or deactivated. We've applied it in different situations and in fact Kimberly just won an award for applying this to Alzheimer's disease and discovering that women, we know that women have twice the incidence of Alzheimer's even correcting for the fact that they live longer and when we compared the brains of males and females and looked at how their patterns of expression changed before and after Alzheimer's. What we discovered using this approach and analyzing data sets that have been available for years is something nobody ever found, but as soon as we found it, it was intuitively obvious that the differences between male and female brains relevant to Alzheimer's is in the activation of genes that have estrogen or androgen responsive elements. Okay? Men and women swim in different hormonal oceans, they respond differently. It influences the development and progression of disease. So there's lots more that we can do with this. And I think we're starting to really see that by looking at these channels of, of information flow, we're really starting to discover something that's important for understanding the mechanisms that are driving disease. So we're really excited about Panda because we can start to integrate lots of other types of data. And if you ask me about it, I'll tell you all about it. We have other approaches, which I'm not going to talk about. And I'll just close by telling you genomics is here to stay. 2010, I went to Australia to do a little mini sabbatical. I flew down there with my wife and son. My host picked me up at the airport, drove me to a little cottage we'd rented for the three months that in Brisbane they call winter, uh, but we call summer. Um, but Brisbane is as far south of the equator as Orlando is north of the equator, so it's really beautiful there. We landed, we drove to the house. Christine Wells, my host, then drove me to the car rental place. I picked up the car. I drove back home. If your house works like mine, I walked in the door. My wife looked at me. She looked at the keys, and I said goodbye to the keys for the next three months and rode the bus. So my second day there, I got on the bus, and I looked up, and I saw this sign. It says, spitting is unacceptable. Bus operators are now equipped with DNA kits to assist with the apprehension of offenders. Okay? So genomics is here to stay. I'll finally just close with a quote. I'm a physicist, you now know. You now know physicists are the smartest people on Earth, so I love this quote uh, from Enrico Fermi. Before I came here, I was confused about this subject. After listening to your lecture, I'm still confused, but at a higher level. <laughs> so hopefully I've left you all highly confused, but your questions will illuminate uh, anything you don't know. So thank you for your patience, and I'm happy to answer questions. And we're across the river, so if you want to come over and visit and talk more, just drop me a note. So what, what about the quiz you threatened? <laughs> <laughs> it was a joke. It might be out of time, actually. <laughs> okay.
Actually, I don't know what the difference is. It's a significant difference, but it's not that great. And part of the reason is these women all do badly. The hope is by treating those with the angiogenic subtype who have a poor outcome that we can actually improve outcome for them. Please. I don't know. We've never really looked at that. Uh, we're trying to come up with ways to use Bayesian networks because they're very useful, but Bayesian networks have this NP-complete problem that uh, is really difficult to overcome. It's hard when you have to discretize data. But we've talked about multi-tiered Bayesian networks trying to pass information back and forth, and that's in part what led us to start thinking about this overall approach. The thing I like about it here is it's modeling what's really happening, what we know is happening in these biological networks, that the transcription factors are actually communicating with their targets. No. So we haven't been able to identify those, but it may be other factors other than just a causative mutation. It may be much more complex. So we haven't really built in, although we, we're starting to think about how to do it, genetic changes into the underlying model. So the first thing we've actually shown is you can use epigenetic data to influence the models. And I think it was Doug earlier who was talking about centipede. We've actually uh, benchmarked Panda against centipede on the data that they use to generate centipede. So it's DNA's hypersensitivity data and motif data, nothing else. And when we do that, we actually get a better AUC than they do with centipede alone. And part of the reason that we, we believe that's happening is that this message passing is really optimizing the channels of information flow through the network. So independent of any gene expression data, we're finding something that really points to something we can verify with other types of data. So we're really excited about it because we think it's getting at some essential element of this that's probably evolutionarily driven. Great, thank you, John.